energy and electric potential. Recall the relationship between potential difference, work, and charge. And it turns out if we have two points, A and B, and let's say those are present in some electric field that I just have drawn at some angle, this means that points A and B are at different potential, so there's a potential difference between points A and B. Well, it turns out there's a relation to work and charge. And in fact, if I was to move a charge from point A to point B, it would take a certain amount of work to do that. And if I take that amount of work and divide by charge, I will get the potential difference between those points. I can turn that equation around a little bit and just calculate the work it takes to do that directly, which is the charge times the potential difference between those two points. And remember this definition because this will come up in a few slides. So if we have some ensemble of a number of charges, I'm only showing three here, but two, three, four, any number, there's energy stored in that because they're positive or negative, they're attracting, they're repelling, they want to move, they wanna go somewhere. And so if we're somehow holding them still, there's energy stored there. So how do we calculate this amount of energy? Well, one thing we can do is move these, these charges out to infinity and calculate how much energy it takes to in assemble these things into this current arrangement. And it turns out that will be the same as the energy stored. So the first thing we'll do, we'll take the first charge and move that out from infinity all the way to this point P1. Now there's no other charges yet present and we'll pretend there's no other charges in the universe that could interfere with this. But if there's no other charges present, there's nothing to attract or repel that first charge. So in fact, it takes zero work to move that first charge out from infinity to point one. Now let's move the second charge into place. However, something different is happening here. The first charge is already in place and depending whether they're positive or negative, that could either attract the second charge to help move it along or it could repel it to sort of fight us moving that second charge into place. So borrowing from the equation on the previous slide, the work it takes to move that second charge into place is that second charge times the potential difference. Let's think about this term a little bit. We're starting with the second charge out at infinity. So in fact, the potential there is zero. So the potential difference between these two points is really just the potential at point two. And the only potential that it resides there right now is due to the first charge. So that's why we have this subscript two one. This is the potential due to the first charge at the position of the second charge once it's in place. So that's how to interpret that. On to the third charge. It's a little bit more complicated now because we have two charges in place, the first and the second. So again, that can either help or fight against moving that third charge into place. So in fact, now the work to move the third charge into place has two terms, and that's because there's two previous charges in place. And so both of those will be a Q, the third charge, times the potential difference. This first one, remember the potential, out at infinity is zero. So the potential difference is really just the potential at point three. So this is the potential at point three due to the first charge. And over here is the potential at point two due to the third charge. I said that backwards. Here's the potential, sorry, at the position of the third charge due to the second charge. So to assemble these three charges, First, we move charge one into place, that took no work. We then move the second charge into place, that took some work due to the first charge. And then we move the third charge in place, that potentially took even more work, but we had two charges already in place. And so we add these up, uh, one, two, and three, to get the total amount of work it takes to assemble those three charges. And so here's the expressions that we derive for them, and we add them up to get total work. 
What if we did this in reverse order? We move the third charge in place first, the second charge in place second, and then the first charge into place third. So if we do it in reverse order, moving that third charge into place would take zero work. Moving the second charge into place would just be a Q times a V, the second, the Q of the second charge times the potential at the position of the second charge due to the third charge. And then we have the work it takes to move the first charge into place, which is Q1 times these two potential difference terms two, because we have two charges, Q2 and Q3 already in place. So all we did was reverse the order of this. Okay, pictures are over. Let's work with some equations. We've derived two equations for calculating the total work for assembling those charges. Let's add them together and see what falls out of this. So this was the first thing we did where we moved charge one, charge two, and then charge three into place. The second thing we did was move charge three into place first, then charge two, then charge one. So we have two different equations here. Let's add them together. Now on the right, we can multiply everything out. We can collect common terms on the common Q terms and we end up here. Now look at this expression. We have a V12 plus a V13. Let's just call these two V1. Likewise, we have a V21 and a V23. Let's just call this group of terms V2. And then we have a V31 and a V32. Let's just call these V3. So those will be our total potentials. Now our equation simplifies to two times W. We have the two here because we added two equations, each calculating the amount of work it takes to assemble those charges. So now we have two times that amount of work and we end up with this pretty simple equation. Let's proceed with that. So here's where we were on the previous slide. Well, a great thing to do is divide by two and then solve for W, which is really just dividing by two. And we end up here. So it's pretty straightforward looking at this equation then to generalize what we've written for any number of charges. So the total work to assemble any number of charges, we're just summing these one half Q times V, where this Q is the charge of the charge we're talking about and V is the potential of that charge. And then of course, one half of that, which we move to the outside of the summation. So if we have an ensemble of charges, ignoring now that we have to move them in to do the calculation, but as we have some ensemble of charges, we can simply sum one half Q times V for each one of those to calculate how much energy is stored in that ensemble. And since it's energy, the units are joules. So in summary, we can talk about energy and charge distributions simply by building on what we did for these point charges. Well, we just, looked at a point charge and the total energy is a summation of one half QV. So if we have charge distributions, we can now generalize that. So instead of having a discrete summation for discrete point charges, now we're integrating over a line charge and it's one half times the integral of the line charge density times V. But we can see that's still a essentially a Q times a V and then we have our differential length. So that will be total energy in a charged line. Likewise, if we have a sheet charge, it's one half the surface charge density times the potential. So it's still a one half Q times V, but we have this differential surface here. And then it's straightforward if we have some kind of volume, one half volume charge density times electric potential, but that's still a one half Q times V.